Good evening. Good to see everybody this evening. Hope everyone has had a good afternoon. Mike and uh, Brother Joey and myself uh, enjoyed going to the nursing home this afternoon and visiting with uh, the residents there. Several of those that are members of this congregation we were able to see and they were all having a good day and had a good visit with them and we always look forward to those opportunities that we have and as I mentioned this morning before the sermon if there's any of the men that's not currently involved in going out and helping with the services at the nursing home and you're interested in doing that uh, please let me know uh, we would love to get you in the rotation of going out and helping with that ministry it's always a very uplifting and edifying time that we get to spend together with our brethren at the nursing home. A few weeks back, I was invited to speak on a lectureship up at the Delhaft Congregation up in Myrtle, Missouri. And the subject that they assigned to me for that occasion was standing fast in Christian liberty. Well, initially, I wasn't really sure where they were wanting me to go with that subject. Uh, but after speaking with some of the brethren there and getting a little clarification on exactly the direction they were wanting, that turned into a very interesting study. Well, this week, especially today, here we are two days before Independence Day, a day when American minds are drawn to the subjects of liberty and freedom and independence. I thought that it would be good to go back and kind of rework that lesson. And I say rework that lesson because when I presented that lesson at Delhap, I preached for almost an hour. And I know there's some of you that probably don't want to stay here that long, uh, don't want Elton to miss his bedtime tonight. So, <laughs> so we're going to condense that lesson a little bit, try to re rework it just a little bit. And take a look at this subject of Christian liberty or Christian freedom. Those of you who generally attend on Wednesday nights, you may remember that a couple of months back I shared a story with you during our devotional period about a man by the name of George Wilson. And George Wilson held the distinction of being the very first man to refuse a pardon in United States history. In 1829, he was convicted of mail theft and the murder of a government agent. But in a very early case of political favoritism, he had a friend who was also friends with the President of the United States. And his friend, without the permission of George Wilson, went to this other friend Andrew Jackson, the President of the United States, and secured a pardon for George Wilson. Well, when it was made known to Wilson that he had been pardoned for his crimes, he did the unthinkable. He said, I don't want it. He refused that pardon that had been extended to him. Well, of course, no one knew how to handle this situation. This was something that had never happened before. No one's ever refused a pardon before. Well, for several months in lower courts, they battled back and forth, some saying, well, you know, the president has ordered this, therefore he has to accept the pardon. Others say, well, no, it's contingent upon his acceptance of this pardon. Well, it went all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court finally ruled several months after the refusal of this pardon. And in the answer to their decision. Chief Justice John Marshall, he wrote that a pardon is just a piece of paper, the value of which depends upon its acceptance by the parties implicated. It is hardly to be supposed that one under sentence of death would refuse to accept a pardon. But if it is refused, it is not a pardon. And then he ended his thoughts with this line, George Wilson must die. Now, you stop and you ask yourself, why? Why would he refuse this pardon? Well, we really don't know. 
Some had speculated that he knew he was guilty and he was doing the honest thing and accepting the consequences of his crime. Others have made other speculations, but no one really knows why he refused this pardon. So a few weeks later, his sentence was carried out. He was executed by hanging. But again, the question comes back to why? Why did he die? Was it because he had to? No. He had been offered a pardon, hadn't he? He had the ability to completely wipe his slate clean of every crime he had committed. So it wasn't that he had to die, but it was because he refused this pardon. Now, folks, this is a true story. This really happened. And it is a very sad story. But a story that is even more sad than this is the story of one who rejects another pardon. And that is Christ's offer of pardon. You see, when Christ came to this earth, He came with a purpose. We talked about this a little bit this morning. He came with a purpose to seek and to save the lost. And in His death on the cross, He paid the price for the atonement of our sins so that we would not have to pay that price. So that we would not have to face the consequences of our sins. And in doing this, Jesus has presented to mankind, every single human being, Jesus has presented us with a full pardon. It has been presented to us and all we have to do is accept it. If we will accept the terms of that pardon, then we will not have to pay the consequences. We will not have to face the punishment for the sins that we have committed. You may remember on Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, the gospel was proclaimed. Those who heard the gospel, many of them, they were motivated. They were pricked to the heart and moved by the gospel message. And they wanted to know, what do I need to do in order to change? What do I need to do to be set apart from the sins that I've committed? And Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. So you see, that in the death of Christ, man... Lost in sin, destined for eternal condemnation, has now been offered a full pardon. All mankind can now have their sins forgiven. All mankind can now have the hope of heaven because of the sacrifice of Jesus. But tragically, just like in the story of George Wilson, the majority of people will reject that pardon. The majority of people on earth will say, I don't want it. Take it away. I'll face whatever consequences come along. And essentially what they are doing, and this brings us into our subject for tonight, essentially what they are doing, they are tearing up their ticket to freedom. They're saying, no, we will remain bound in sin rather than being set free by the blood of Jesus. Now remember, a pardon is only a pardon if it is accepted. There's only power in the pardon if the one it is extended to accepts the power of the pardon. Now, a pardon cannot be forced on anyone. That's what the Supreme Court determined with George Wilson. It can't be forced. And in the same way, Jesus is not going to force his pardon upon anyone. He extends it. But it's up to us whether we accept it or not. Now for those who will accept the pardon that is extended by Jesus, we're going to find that we will come to enjoy a special freedom. A Christian freedom. In James 1 and verse 25, in reference to the gospel of Christ, James writes, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. 
Well, then if you skip over to the next chapter, we find James adding this in James 2 and verse 12. He says, So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. Now this word, liberty, carries with it the connotation, the meaning, it's a a synonym of the word freedom. Freedom and liberty. So when we talk about the perfect law of liberty, the perfect law of freedom, we're being told that you are to know it, you are to live in it, you are to continue in the things that are a part of that law. Now we as American people, more than anyone else on the face of this earth, we understand the concepts of freedom, don't we? Because our nation was founded upon the goal of providing freedom from tyranny. Freedom from the oppression of other nations. We have so many things that are listed in our Bill of Rights, so many uh, human rights and freedoms that are provided for us in this country that other nations do not have. We live in a country that prides itself on freedom. So when James refers to this perfect law of liberty, we see that there is no question that he's speaking about the law of Christ. There was not a soul, whenever they heard this designation, perfect law of liberty, that thought, you know, he's talking about the law of Moses. There wasn't anyone that that had that in their mind. Because the writer of Hebrews speaking about the weakness of the law of Moses, he said in chapter 8 and verse 8, he says, If the first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. For finding fault with them, he saith, I will make a new covenant. So, we see that the old law was not perfect. The old law had its flaws. But did the old law provide liberty? Not hardly. You think about this for just a moment. Paul wrote in Galatians 5 and verse 1, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. Now hold on. Notice it doesn't say the law of Moses made us free. It says wherein Christ has made us free. But then look at the next statement. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. What's the yoke of bondage? The law of Moses. He says, Jesus has come along. Jesus has set you free from the bonds of the law of Moses. He has set you free from the bonds of sin. Do not let yourself get entangled in that again. Stand fast in the freedom that Christ has provided for you. If we go back to Hebrews once again in Hebrews 7 and verse 19, we find an indication here of a lack of perfection in the old law. Those who were living under the law of Moses, they were not able to live up to the standard of that law. In fact, the writer of Hebrews tells us that they had no way under the law of Moses to be spiritually complete. There was still something that was lacking with those who were living under that law. In fact, Paul reveals in Colossians 1 and verse 28 that the only way that we can be spiritually complete, and what he means by that is provided with everything that we need to live a life that is pleasing to God, the only way that we can be spiritually complete is in Christ Jesus, is what he has provided for us. And so ultimately what we see is that in Christ, Freedom has been won. In Christ, this freedom has been provided for us. Like we've been talking about in our Sunday morning sermons over the last several weeks, there in John chapter 14, verses 6 and 7, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. But then notice verse 7. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also, And from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. So the question then arises, 
how do we come to know Christ and thereby obtain this Christian freedom? How do we come to have that kind of relationship and receive those blessings that are promised to us? Well, if we go back to John chapter 1 and verse 1, let's go back to the beginning of that gospel account. It is revealed to us that in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. And then moving to John 8, verses 31 and 32, Jesus says, if you continue in what? If you continue in my Word, then are you my disciples indeed and you shall know what? You shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. There's that freedom we're talking about. The truth shall make you free. So if we come to know the Word, then we will come to know the truth. For God's Word is truth. But then he goes on to tell us that by knowing that truth, then we will come to know and understand the things that are expected of us in order to have this freedom in order to be set free from the bonds of sin and to have this freedom in Christ Jesus. You see, when we obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, we are set free from the yoke of bondage that held that sin held over us up to that point. Up to that point, we had no way to be set free from our sins. It was only through obeying the gospel of Christ that we were set free from our sins. And it's beyond me how anyone who has ever tasted of the freedom that we receive when we become a child of God, it is beyond me why anyone would ever want to give that up and go back into bondage once again. Why would anyone want to give up the freedoms that they have? in order to go back under oppression, to go back under sin. It's beyond me. But now think with me for just a moment along secular lines. Yes, we live in a country that prides itself upon freedom. We enjoy the freedoms that we have. But is it possible for us to lose some of those freedoms that we have? Absolutely. Through the decisions that we make, we can come to lose some of the freedoms that we so much enjoy. For instance, if we break the law. Some of the consequences of breaking the law could be the loss of certain freedoms that we have. We think also along the lines, and thankfully in our country, we don't see this being as much of an issue as it once was. But we think about the days during racial prejudice when so many times, based upon a person's prejudicial feelings towards someone else, they would hold them back from certain freedoms and certain liberties that were due to them. They were losing those freedoms because of the attitudes of others. Or, you know, we might even throw out there, if we elect politicians who seek only to control by overstepping government bounds, then we may lose some of the freedoms that are due to us based upon the decisions that they make. Well, the same is true with Christian freedom, isn't it? We are free as long as we keep away from sin. We are free as long as we are doing the Lord's will. But if we succumb to sin... The consequences of those sins could be that we lose some of those freedoms that we have in Christ. Or maybe we allow ourselves to be led astray by the decisions that are made by elders or the teachings that are put forth by preachers and we don't compare those things with the scriptures and we simply accept the things that we're being taught. and We're led away into false doctrine. We can lose some of the freedoms that we have in Christ. Or maybe we allow our traditions or our opinions to become doctrine to us. We develop the mentality that my opinion is doctrine, that this is the way that it has to be. And then we try to force that upon other people. Well, if other people 
cave in to our desires and give in to our opinions, then they are giving up a freedom, a liberty that they have in Christ. So the question arises, what should we do? If we find ourselves in a position where we find that we are having to give up some of these freedoms that we have in Christ, if we find ourselves in a position where based upon false teachings or the, the, the forcing of opinions, things of that nature, we find that we are being held back from exercising certain freedoms that we have as children of God, what should we do? Well, Paul says it best in 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 17 where he says, come out from among them. Don't stay in that situation. If you're in a position where the freedom that you have in Christ is being impeded either by sin, well then come out of that sin. Leave it behind. If it's someone else that is leading you into sin that's causing you to lose some of the freedom that you have, come out from among that group. Leave that ideology behind. As Paul says, come out from among them and be ye separate. Leave it behind. Don't give up the freedoms that you have in Christ. Leave that which is impeding your freedom in Christ. Separate yourself from that yoke of bondage that's been placed upon you again. Don't fall back into that scenario of being held back, of losing that freedom. Now you think about our society today for just a moment. And our society, more than any other society that any of us have ever witnessed in our lifetime, especially here in this nation, is so enslaved to their desires, is so enslaved to their idea of freedom. Because to most people today, their idea of freedom is, well, freedom lets me do whatever I want to do. I can believe whatever I want to believe. I can practice whatever I want to practice. I can live however I want. I can follow whatever moral standing I want to follow. And I have the right to do that because I'm free. Well, what they fail to realize is that rather than living a life of freedom, they're actually living a life of bondage enslaved to worldly desires, being controlled by their passions. They're not free. They've made their choice. And their life is being controlled by that carnal man. Sin, though, has so clouded their eyes that they can't see that situation. Sin has convinced them, I'm exercising my freedoms. And they fail to see the sad situation that they're in. I want to share an example with you of this. If you turn to Galatians chapter 5 verses 1 through 4, we see a very early example in the days of the church where a freedom was being lost. A freedom that uh, was being Im impeded upon by false doctrine. Here was a time that rather than standing fast in the freedom that they had, here were some Christians who were allowing false doctrines to cause them to lose some of their freedoms. And what we find in this passage is that in the churches of Galatia, there were some people there who had left idolatry behind. They had been set free in Christ. These were Christian people. But yet... They were allowing themselves to become enslaved again because they were trying to go back to the old law and bring certain tenets of the old law into the church as forms of justification. Well, you may wonder, why would anybody do that? Why would anyone want to try to go back into that kind of system after they've been set free from it. Well, Paul states very clearly in verse 2, he says, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Well, that was the issue that was at hand. You may remember back in Acts 15 and verse 1, we read about a group of people that are known as Judaizing teachers. These were people who 
uh, were a part of the church. These were people, though, who had begun to try to bring certain tenets of the old law into the kingdom. And the main thing that they were teaching is that in order to be justified, meaning in order to be right in the sight of God, yes, you had to do everything that Jesus has said. Yes, you have to do everything that the apostles have told you to do. But if you're a man, you also have to be circumcised. They say, you know, that that was something that was never taken away. It's still expected. And so many in the churches of Galatia had begun to develop this idea. They had begun to practice circumcision once again. But they were doing this because they believed that there was a direct correlation between circumcision and their salvation. Yes, they were still going through the process of obeying the uh, the plan of salvation as we teach it today, but they were adding another step to that. They were saying, it doesn't matter if you hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. If you're not circumcised, then you're not saved. Well, Paul came along, and he contradicted what they had been taught. He came along, and he established that they were giving up. Now listen to this. They were giving up every advantage and every benefit that they had in Christ Jesus by bringing this practice over from the old law. Ultimately, he's saying, folks, you are rejecting the new covenant because you're trying to continue to practice the old covenant. He says you're losing all of the freedoms that Jesus has provided. You're entering back into that yoke of bondage. Because you're practicing something that you do not have to practice. And notice verse 3. He explains why this is the case. He says, For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Simply put, he said, Folks, you can't just pick and choose what you like in the old law and bring it in and add it to the new law. He says, if you're going to follow the old law, then you better follow every bit of it. He says, you are a debtor to do the whole law. But how many times, even still today, folks, do we see people, even within the Lord's church, who will try to go back into the law of Moses to try to justify certain unscriptural practices that they want to engage in? How many times do we see those in the denominational world Especially when you start talking to them about, you know, why do we not use instrumental music in our worship services? Where do they always turn? They want to take you to the book of Psalms. They want to go into the old law. Or you see those, for instance, who uh, have uh, the burning of candles and incense in their worship services. Well, where do they go to justify that? They go back into the worship of the temple under the old law. Even the observance of certain feasts and holidays that we see Christian people engaging in today, they'll go back into the law of Moses. And they'll want to bring all of those things over. But you notice there are certain things we don't ever see them wanting to do. They don't want to bring back animal sacrifice. They don't want to bring back, like we talked about in our Bible study this morning, the requirement of all the men going to Jerusalem twice a year to observe feasts. They don't want to bring back every bit of it. But they want to bring over the things that go along with what they want to practice. Well, that's what we saw taking place in the churches of Galatia. They were saying that, you know, from the time of Abraham, this is something that has been expected. Therefore, in order to be pleasing to God, this is something that necessarily has to carry over into the new law. Now, Paul says, no, that's not the case. And the way that he presents this, he says, folks, he says, you're free to practice circumcision if you want to. And we see that there are many people even still today that do practice this for its hygienic purposes and other health reasons. In fact, over 50% of all baby boys that are born in the United States today are circumcised. 
But unless the families of those children are practicing Judaism, that's not done for a religious purpose. So Paul says, if that's something that you want to do, you you have the liberty to do that. You have the freedom to do that, but you do not have the freedom to turn this into doctrine. You do not have the freedom to say that if you do not engage in this, then you're not saved. You're not a Christian. In fact, he says, if that's the mentality that you want to take, he says there's 612 other laws in the law of Moses that you need to be practicing also. But they wanted to hold on to just that one. Folks, we need to understand. We need to understand that Christ went to the cross to liberate us from the old law. Think about that for a moment. Christ went to the cross to set us free. And who do we think we are to try to retain some of that? What Christ died to set us free from. We need to appreciate that. We need to honor that sacrifice that he made by leaving those things that are a part of that old covenant behind and obey the commandments of Jesus Christ. Folks, what it comes down to is we cannot add something to the gospel and remain in Christ. We cannot take something away from the gospel and remain in Christ. Because Paul says if you do that, And I know that this is a statement that many people in the religious world will strongly disagree with, but it's exactly what Paul is saying in this verse. He says, if you add to or take away even one thing from the gospel of Christ, you have lost every benefit you received under that covenant. Everything that Christ died to provide for you, that you received when you became a child of God, you've thrown it all away. Because you wanted it your way. You believed that you had freedom to do that. But you don't. But you don't. Paul then goes on to state this even more dramatically. When he talks about in verse 4 the fact that he says that to submit to circumcision means that you have been severed off from Christ. So by bringing in this false doctrine... He says, you're no longer a Christian. He says, you are no longer in the good graces of God. Very strong, very terrifying declaration. He says, because you've made your choice that you want to be justified by the law. You've made your decision that you want to be justified by circumcision. But you know, we could put any other false doctrine in that line, couldn't we? if we try to be justified by anything other than the gospel of Jesus Christ, then we have cut ourselves off from the blessings of Christ, from the freedoms that he provides for us. And we're no longer receiving that freedom. We're no longer receiving the grace of God when we turn away from it. This idea that once we receive the grace of God, we will always receive the grace of God or once we're saved, we're always saved, is as false as false can be. Yes, the Scriptures do tell us, Paul tells us very emphatically in Romans 8, 35-39, that there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God, but yet there are things that we can do to separate us from the grace of God. When we turn away from the will of God, and we go to practicing things that are contrary to it, then we fall from grace. Because ultimately, folks, what it comes down to is when we try to earn our salvation, we fail miserably. When we try to achieve that justification on our own without Christ, we fail every time. And this is why Jesus begins his Sermon on the Mount there in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 3 with the teaching that it's the poor in spirit, those who are humble, 
that are going to possess the kingdom of heaven. And this is also why God on two separate occasions in James 4 and verse 6 and also 1 Peter 5 and verse 5 says that God resists the proud, but He giveth grace unto the humble. The humble are the ones that are going to receive the grace of God because the humble are the ones who recognize the need for the grace of God. The humble are the ones who recognize that we can't be set apart from our sins without God. But those who are proud, they try to find another way. Try to choose another path. But this freedom that we have in Christ, folks, it's not the freedom to do what we want to do. What it is, it's the freedom to give up what we want to do in order to accept what God wants us to do. That's the freedom that we have in Christ. Paul describes it this way in Galatians 5.13. He says, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. He says this freedom that we have is not intended to be something that you use for selfish purposes. It's not something that you use because you are self-centered and you want to direct your own path. No, the freedom that we have is the freedom to lay our way aside and to adopt God's way. That's the freedom that Christ died to provide us with. But you know, I think what so much of this stems from is a lack of understanding of this concept of freedom. As I said, in our society today, freedom means I can do what I want, when I want, however I want, and I don't care who else it hurts. You know, one of the most outspoken anti-Christian groups in the world today is known as the Freedom From Religion Foundation. They're saying, you know what, you've got the freedom to reject religion. Well, you know, we do have a choice to make of whether we are going to follow God or not, we do have a choice. But Christian freedom is not a permission to choose our own path. Christian freedom is the, the, the right to follow Christ's way. But also, Christian freedom, we need to understand this, and we're out of time, but just really quickly here. Christian freedom also is not a permission for us just to agree to disagree on matters of faith and truth. Now, when it comes to opinion and personal preference, yes, we can agree to disagree. But when it comes to biblical truth, we do not have the freedom to disagree. And we cannot stand upon that argument. Well, we're just just going to agree to disagree. Not if there is biblical proof. We stand upon the truth of the Word of God. This freedom that we receive is truly one of the greatest blessings that God has given to mankind. We need to love it. We need to cherish it. We don't need to allow it to be infringed upon. But it's very likely that there's someone here tonight that has never received that freedom. There's probably someone here tonight who has never placed their faith in Christ, repented of their sins, confessed that faith, and been baptized. It's only by following that plan of salvation that we are set free from that yoke of bondage, that we are set free from our sins, that we take advantage of the blessings that Christ's sacrifice affords to us. And we receive that freedom that the blood of Christ provides. You know, we sing a song sometimes, What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. But also, there may be someone here who has forfeited those freedoms. Maybe you have allowed sin to come back into your life. And because of those sins, you have become separated from Christ. If so, there's good news. You can regain that freedom. You can turn away from those sins that you're engaged in. 
Leave that behind and come back to a position of faithfulness. Repent of those sins. Come back to Christ. He will forgive you. He will receive you back into his own and he will provide you with that freedom once again. And so tonight, as we bring this lesson to a close, reflect upon your spiritual condition. And if there is a spiritual need in your life that we can assist you with, we want you to come forward and make that known at this time while we stand and sing.